News of the Times, Frightful Fridays, Aristocracy, Murder and Scandal. Welcome to News of the Times. In this episode, we look at the world of the aristocracy and the privileged. Both stories in this episode were the top headline stories of their day. We start with Lawrence, the Earl of Ferrer in 1760, who has the distinction of being the last peer to be hung, and to be hung at Tyburn, the same place as all the common criminals were hung, was even more galling and somewhat unbelievable at the time. Our second story involves what was the biggest scandal of its time. The story of the Wiltshire heiress. Fabulously rich and quite beautiful, fate plays a hand on making her the sole recipient of a fortune estimated at the time worth some 35 million in 2023. She was chased by the future King of England, George IV, but in truth she could have had any man she wanted. She chose one of the most renowned wastrels of his day. Her ensuing unhappiness at his cruelty was believed to have helped her die relatively young. Aristocracy, murder and scandal is today's Frightful Fridays episode. Lawrence Earl of Ferrer. This famous case made legal history as the last peer to be hanged. The Earl was infamous for his quick and brutal temper. From the Newgate calendar, the 5th of May, 1760, Lawrence Earl of Ferrer's, executed at Tyburn on the 5th of May, 1760, for the murder of his steward after a trial before his peers. Lawrence, Earl of Ferrers, was descended of an ancient and noble family. The royal blood of the Plantagenets flowed in his veins, and the Earl gained his title in the following manner. In the year 1711, Robert, Lord Ferrers, was created by Queen Anne, Viscount Tamworth and Earl Ferrers, and it appears that although the estates of the family were very great, they were vastly diminished by the provisions which the Earl thought proper to make for his numerous progeny, consisting of fifteen sons and twelve daughters, born to him by his two wives. At the death of the first earl, his title descended to his second son, but he, dying without issue, it went in succession to the ninth son, who was childless, and the tenth son, who was the father of the earl, Lawrence, the subject of the present sketch. This nobleman was married in the year 1752 to the youngest daughter of Sir William Meredith, and although his general conduct, when sober, was not such as to be remarkable, yet his faculties were so much impaired by drink that, when under the influence of intoxication, he acted with all the wildness and brutality of a madman. At Derby Races in the year 1756, Lord Ferrers ran his mare against Captain M's horse for fifty pounds and was the winner. When the race was ended, he spent the evening with some gentlemen and in the course of conversation, the captain, who had heard that his lordship's mare was with foal, proposed in a verbose manner to run his horse against her at the expiration of seven months. Lord Ferrers was so affronted 
by this circumstance, which he conceived to have arisen from a preconcentrated plan to insult him, that he quitted Derby at three o'clock in the morning and went immediately to his seat at Stanton Harold in Leicestershire. He rang his bell as soon as he awakened, and a servant attending, he asked if he knew how Captain M came to be informed that his mare was with foal. The servant declared that he was ignorant of the matter, but the groom might have told it. And the groom, being called, he denied having given any information respecting the matter. Invitation rejected. Previous to the affront presumed to have been given on the preceding evening, Lord Ferrers had invited the captain and the rest of the company to dine with him as on that day, but they all refused their attendance, though he sent a servant to remind them that they had promised to come. Lord Ferrers was so enraged at this disappointment that he kicked and horsewhipped his servants and threw at them such articles as lay within his reach. The following will afford a specimen of the brutality of Lord Ferrer's behaviour. Some oysters had been sent from London, which not proving good, his lordship directed one of the servants to swear that the carrier had changed them. But the servant declined to take such an oath. The earl flew on him in a rage, stabbed him in the breast with a knife, cut his head with a candlestick, and kicked him in the groin with such severity that he was incapable of a retention of urine for several years afterwards. Lord Ferrer's brother and his wife, paying a visit to him and his countess at Stanton Harold, some dispute arose between the parties, and Lady Ferrer's being absent from the room, the earl ran upstairs with a large clasp knife in his hand and asked a servant whom he met where his lady was. The man said, in her own room, and being directed to follow him thither, Lord Ferrers ordered him to load a brace of pistols with bullets. This order was complied with, but the servant, apprehensive of mischief, declined priming the pistols, which Lord Ferrers, discovering, swore at him, asked him for powder, and primed them himself. He then threatened that if he did not immediately go and shoot his brother, the captain, he would blow his brains out. The servant, hesitating, his lordship pulled the trigger of one of the pistols, but it misfired. Hereupon the countess dropped on her knees and begged him to appease his passions, but in return he swore at her and threatened her destruction if she opposed him. The servant now escaped from the room and reported what had passed to his lordship's brother, who immediately called his wife from her bed, and they left the house, though it was then two o'clock in the morning. Wife's Departure For a time his wife perceived nothing which induced her to repent the step she had taken in being united to him, but he subsequently behaved to her with such unwarrantable cruelty that she was compelled to quit his protection, and rejoined her father's family to apply to Parliament for redress. An act was in consequence passed, allowing her a separate maintenance to be raised out of her husband's estate, and trustees being appointed, the unfortunate Mr. Johnson, who fell a sacrifice to the ungovernable passion of Lord Ferrers, having been bred up in the family from his youth, and being distinguished for the regular manner in which he kept his accounts, and his fidelity as a steward, 
was proposed as receiver of the rents for her use. He at first declined the office, but subsequently, at the desire of the Earl himself, consented to act, and continued in this employment for a considerable time. His lordship at this time lived at Stanton, a seat about two miles from Ashby de la Zouche in Leicestershire, and his family consisted of Mrs. Clifford, a lady who lived with him, and her four natural daughters, besides five men servants, exclusive of an old man and a boy, and three maids. Mr. Johnson lived at the house belonging to the farm, which he held under his lordship called the Lant, and about half a mile distant from Stanton. It appears that it was his custom to visit his noble master occasionally to settle the accounts which were placed under his care, but his lordship gradually conceived a dislike for him, grounded upon the prejudice raised in his mind on account of him being the receiver of the countess's portion, and charged him with having combined with the trustees to prevent his receiving a coal contract. From this time he spoke of him in opprobrious terms, and said he had conspired with his enemies to injure him, and that he was a villain, and with these sentiments he gave him warning to quit an advantageous farm which he held under his lordship. On Sunday the 13th of January 1760, Lord Ferrers went to the Lount, and, after some discourse, with Mr. Johnson, ordered him to come to him at Stanton on the Friday following the 18th at three o'clock in the afternoon. His lordship's usual dinner hour was two o'clock, and soon after the meal was disposed of on the Friday, he went to Mrs. Clifford, who was in the still house, and desired her to take the children for a walk. She accompaningly prepared herself and her daughters, and, with the permission of the Earl, went to her father's, at a short distance, being directed to return at half-past five. The men-servants were next dispatched on errands by their master, who was thus left in the house with the three females only. In a short time afterwards, Mr. Johnson came according to his appointment, and was admitted by one of the maidservants named Elizabeth Bergland. He proceeded at once to his lordship's apartment, but was desired to wait in the still house, and then, after the expiration of about ten minutes, the Earl, calling him into his own room, went in with him and locked the door. Being thus together, the Earl required him first to settle an account, and then, charging him with the villainy which he attributed to him, ordered him to kneel down. The unfortunate man went down on one knee upon which the Earl, in a tone of voice loud enough to be heard by the maidservants, without pride, down on your other knee, Declare that you have acted against Lord Ferrers. Your time is come. You must die. Then suddenly drawing a pistol from his pocket, which was loaded, he presented it and immediately fired. The ball entered the body of the unfortunate man, but he rose up and, entreating that no further violence might be done to him, and the female servants at the time coming to the door, being alarmed by the report, his lordship quitted the room. A messenger was immediately dispatched for Mr. Kirkland, the surgeon, who lived at Ashby de la Zouche, and Johnson being put to bed, his lordship went to him and asked him how he felt. He answered that he was dying, and desired that his family might be sent for. Miss Johnson soon after arrived, and Lord Ferrers immediately 
followed her into the room where her father lay. He then pulled down the clothes and applied a pledget dipped in arquebused water to the wound and soon after left him. From this time it appears that his lordship applied himself to his favourite amusement, drinking, until he became exceedingly violent, for at the time of the commission of the murder he is reported to have been sober and on the arrival of Mr. Kirkland he told him that he had shot Johnson, but believed he was more frightened than hurt, that he had intended to shoot him dead, for that he was a villain and deserved to die. But, said he, now that I have spared his life, I desire you would do what you can for him. His lordship at the same time desired that he would not suffer himself to be seized, and declared that if any one should attempt it, he would shoot them. Mr. Kirkland told him that he should not be seized, and directly went to the wounded man. He found the ball had lodged in the body, at which his lordship expressed a great surprise, declaring that he had tried that pistol a few days before, and that then carried a ball through a deal board nearly an inch and a half, thick. Mr. Kirkland then went upstairs to prepare some dressings, and my lord soon after left the room. From this time, in proportion as the liquor which he continued to drink took effect, his passions became more tumultuous, became more tumultuous, and the transient fit of compassion, mixed with fear for himself, which had excited him, gave way to starts of rage and the predominance of malice. He went up into the room where Johnson was dying and pulled him by the wig, calling him a villain, and threatened to shoot him through the head, and the last time he went to him he was with great difficulty prevented from tearing the clothes off the bed that he might strike him. A proposal was made to him in the evening by Mrs. Clifford, that Mr. Johnson should be removed to his own house. But he replied, He shall not be removed. I will keep him here to plague the villain. He afterwards spoke to Miss Johnson about her father and told her that if he died, he would take care of her and of the family, provided they did not prosecute. When his lordship went to bed, which was between eleven and twelve, he told Mr. Kirkland that he knew he could, if he would, set the affair in such a light as to prevent his being seized, desiring that he might see him before he went away in the morning, and declaring that he would rise at any hour. Mr. Kirkland, however, was very solicitous to get Mr. Johnson removed and as soon as the earl had gone he set about carrying his object into effect. He, in consequence, went to Lount, and, having fitted up an easy chair with poles by way of a sedan, he procured a guard, returned at about two o'clock, and carried Mr. Johnson to his house, where he expired at about nine o'clock on the following morning. The neighbours now began to take measures to secure the murderer, and a few of them, having armed themselves, set out for Stanton, and as they entered the yard they saw his lordship, partly undressed, going towards the stable, as if to take out a horse. One of them named Springthorpe, then advancing towards his lordship with a pistol in his hand, required him to surrender, but the latter putting his hand toward his pocket, his assailant, imagining that he was feeling for some weapon of offence, stopped short and allowed him to escape into the house. A great concourse of people by this time had come to the spot, and they cried out loudly that the Earl should come forth. Two hours elapsed, however, before anything was seen of him and then he came to the garret window and called out, How is Johnson? 
he was answered that he was dead. But he said it was a lie, and desired that the people should disperse, and then he gave orders that they should be let in and furnished with victuals and drink, and finally he went away from the window, swearing that no man should take him. The mob remained on the spot, and in about two hours the earl was destroyed by a collier named Court Curtis, walking on the bowling green, armed with a blunderbuss, a brace of pistols and a dagger. Curtis, however, was far from being intimidated by his bold appearance, walked up to him and his lordship, struck with the resolution he displayed, immediately surrendered himself and gave up his arms, but directly afterwards declared that he had killed the villain and gloried in the act. He was instantly conveyed in custody to a public house at Ashby, kept by a man named Kinsey, and a coroner's jury having brought in the verdict of willful murder against him, he was on the following Monday committed to the custody of the keeper of the jail at Leicester. Being entitled, however, by his rank to be tried before his peers, he was, about a fortnight afterwards, conveyed to London in his Lando, drawn by six horses under a strong guard, and, being carried before the House of Lords, he was committed to the custody of the Black Rod, and ordered to the Tower, where he arrived at about six o'clock on the evening of the 14th of February. He is reported to have behaved during the whole journey and at his commitment with great calmness and propriety. He was confined in the round tower near the drawbridge. Two warders were constantly in the room with him, one at the door and two sentinels were posted at the bottom of the stairs and one upon the drawbridge with their bayonets fixed. And from this time the gates were ordered to be shut an hour sooner than usual. During his confinement he was moderate both in eating and drinking. His breakfast was a half-pint basin of tea with a small spoonful of brandy in it, and a muffin. With his dinner he generally drank a pint of wine and a pint of water, and another pint of each with his supper. In general his behaviour was decent and quiet except that he would sometimes suddenly start, tear open his waistcoat, and use other gestures which showed that his mind was disturbed. Mrs Clifford and the four young ladies who had come with him from Leicestershire took a lodging in Tower Street, and for some time a servant was continually passing with letters between them, but afterwards this correspondence was permitted only once a day. Mrs. Clifford came three times to the tower to see him, but was not admitted, but his children were suffered to be with him for some time. On the 16th of April, having been a prisoner in the tower two months and two days, he was brought to his trial, which continued till the 18th, before the House of Lords, assembled for that purpose, Lord Henley, Keeper of the Great Seal, having been created Lord High Steward upon the occasion. The murder was easily proven to have been committed, and his lordship then proceeded to enter upon his defence. He called several witnesses, the object of whose testimony was to show that the Earl was not of sound mind but none of them proved such an insanity as made him not accountable for his conduct. His lordship managed to defend himself in such a manner as showed an uncommon understanding. He mentioned the fact of his being reduced to the necessity of attempting to prove himself a lunatic, that he might not be deemed a murderer with the most delicate and affecting sensibilities and, when he found that his plea could not avail him, he confessed that he made it only to gratify his friends. 
that he was always averse to it himself, and that it had prevented what he had proposed, and what perhaps might have taken off the malignity, at least, of the accusation. The peers, having in the usual form delivered their verdict of guilty, his lordship received sentences to be hanged on Monday the 21st of April, and then to be anatomized. but in consideration of his rank, the execution of this sentence was respited till Monday the 5th of May. During this interval he made a will by which he left £1,300 to Mr. Johnson's children, £1,000 to each of his four natural daughters, and £60 a year to Mrs. Clifford for her life. But this disposition of his property being made after his conviction was not valid, although it was said that the same or nearly the same provision was afterwards made for the parties named. In the meantime, a scaffold was erected under the gallows at Tyburn, and part of it, about a yard square, was raised about eighteen inches above the rest of the floor, with the contrivance to sink down upon a signal given in accordance with the plan that invariably adopted the whole being covered with black bays. On the morning of the 5th of May, at about nine o'clock, his lordship's body was demanded of the keeper of the tower by the sheriffs of London and Middlesex, and his lordship, being informed of it, sent a message to the sheriffs requesting that he might be permitted to be conveyed to the scaffold in his own landau, in preference to the mourning coach which was provided for him. This being granted, his landau, drawn by six horses, immediately drew up, and he entered it, accompanied by Mr. Humphreys, the chaplain of the tower, who had been admitted to him that morning for the first time. On the carriage reaching the outer gate, the earl was delivered up to the sheriff, and Mr. Sheriff Valiant entered the vehicle with him, expressing his concern at having so melancholy a duty to perform but his lordship said he was much obliged to him and took it kindly, and he accompanied him. The earl was attired in a white suit richly embroidered with silver, and when he put it on he said, This is the suit in which I was married and in which I will die. The procession being now formed with slowly the Lando being preceded by a considerable body of horse grenadiers and by a carriage containing Mr. Sheriff Errington and his under-sheriff, Mr. Jackson, and being followed by the carriage of Mr. Sheriff Valiant containing Mr. Nichols, his under-sheriff, a mourning coach and six containing some of his lordship's friends and a hearse and six for the conveyance of his body to Surgeon's Hall after being executed and another body of military. The pace at which they proceeded in consequence of the density of the mob was so slow that his lordship was two hours and three quarters in his landau, but during that time he appeared perfectly easy and composed, though he often expressed his anxiety to have the whole affair over, saying that the apparatus of death and the passing through such crowds were worse than death itself, and that he supposed so large a mob had been collected because the people had never seen a lord hanged before. He told the sheriff that he had written to the king to beg that he might suffer where his ancestor, the Earl of Essex, had been executed, and that he had the greatest hopes of obtaining that favour, as he had the honour of quartering part of the same arms, and of being allied to his majesty, but that he had refused, and he thought it hard that he must die at the place appointed for the execution of common felons. 
When his lordship had arrived at that part of Holborn which is near Drury Lane, he said he was thirsty and should be glad of a glass of wine and water, upon which the sheriff's remonstrating with him said that a stop for the purpose would necessarily draw a greater crowd about him, which might possibly disturb and incommode him, yet if his lordship still desired it, it should be done. He most readily answered, That's true, I say no more, let us by no means stop. When the Landau had advanced to the place of execution, his lordship alighted from it, and ascending the scaffold with the same composure and fortitude of mind he had exhibited from the time he left the tower. Soon after he had mounted the scaffold, Mr. Humphreys asked his lordship if he chose to say prayers, which he declined. But upon him asking if he did not choose to join him in the Lord's Prayer, he readily answered he would, for he always thought it a very fine prayer. Upon which they knelt down together upon two cushions covered with black bays, and his lordship with an audible voice, very devoutly repeated the Lord's Prayer, and afterwards with great energy ejaculated, O oh God, forgive me all my errors, pardon all my sins. His Lordship then, rising, took his leave of the Sheriff and the Chaplain, and, after thanking them for their many civilities, presented his watch to Mr. Sheriff Valiant, of which he desired his acceptance, and requested that his body might be buried at Breeden or Stanton in Leicestershire. The executioner now proceeded to do his duty, to which his lordship with great resignation submitted, his neckcloth being taken off, and a white cap which he had brought in his pocket being put upon his head, his arms secured by a black sash, and the cord put round his neck. He advanced by three steps to the elevated part of the scaffold, and, standing under the crossbeam which went over it, which was also covered with black bays, he asked the executioner, Am I all right? Then the cap was drawn over his face, and, upon a signal given by the sheriff, for his lordship, upon being asked before, declined to give one himself, that part upon which he stood instantly sank down from beneath his feet, and he was launched into eternity on the 5th of May, 1760. The accustomed time of one hour being passed, the coffin was raised up with the greatest decency to receive the body, and, being deposited in the hearse, he was conveyed by the sheriffs with the same procession to Surgeon's Hall to undergo the remainder of the sentence. A large incision was then made from the neck to the bottom of the breast and another across the throat. The lower part of the belly was laid open and the bowels taken away. It was soon afterwards publicly exposed to view in a room up one pair of stairs at the hall, and on the evening of Thursday the 8th of May it was delivered to his friends for interment. This story was given as a regular example of those of the privileged class were equally answerable to the law. Our next story involves a scandal which was the subject of speculation at the time, the sad story of the Wiltshire heiress. Catherine Tilney Long, 1789 to 1825, was beautiful and exceedingly rich. With the death of her brother, the whole of the considerable fortune of estates, estimated at the time of being worth £300,000, or approximately £34 million today, landed in her lap. As to be expected, she was ardently pursued for marriage. Her admirers, including the Duke of Clarence, the future King William IV, who had amassed considerable debt, 
If Catherine had accepted his proposal, she would have eventually become Queen of England with her offspring in line for the throne. Instead, Catherine chose a rogue known drunk man about town, William Wesley Pole, who had his own staggeringly high accumulated debts. William, an Anglo-Irish nobleman, was, was a nephew to the Duke of Wellington. He was a known dandy and good friends with Beau Brummel and Lord Byron. William enjoyed a reputation of being a profligate drinker and womanizer, and was known for his reckless and wild behaviour. Catherine married for love, despite a wide range of warnings given to her by friends and family, including William's very own family. From the Chester Chronicle, the 17th of January, 1812. Monday, the long-expected union between Miss Tinley Long and Mr. W. Pole took place, a union which, before its solemnization, created more fashionable conversation and conjecture than any marriage project for many years past. The preparations made for honouring the event with that distinction which it demanded were of the most splendid and costly description imaginable. Her family, who possibly had slightly better sense than Catherine, insisted on the Times version of a prenuptial agreement to ensure that he did not run through all of Catherine's money. Her family's fears ended up being very well grounded. The wedding was sumptuous and the talk of the day. Catherine's white satin dress had cost 700 guineas, which is worth approximately 155,000 pounds in 2023. Catherine herself was driven to the church in a new yellow carriage drawn by four grey Arabian horses. Catherine arrived at the church only to find out that William had forgotten to buy the ring. It would only get worse from there. Almost immediately, William began new affairs, one of which resulted in a child. Catherine was aware of the affairs and kept a dignified silence, yet it was her money supporting both the mother and the child. Catherine and William together had four children, two sons and two daughters. William's new debts eventually pursued him to the point where he needed to leave the country. He escaped to France with Catherine and her three small children following him. William began a new tempestuous affair with his cousin, Helena Blight. However, in this case, he moved his mistress into the house which he shared with Catherine, his wife. By all accounts, William and his cousin and mistress Helena would torment and provoke Catherine with open displays of affection toward each other and by belittling Catherine in front of the servants. The public displays became more and more explicit, and sometimes with Catherine present to see all. It is around this time that letters from Catherine to her sister indicate that Catherine had picked up a venereal disease from William. Attempts were made by William to have the children side with him over their mother. One story recounts how William had attempted to get the two boys drunk, then aged ten and eight, respectively. He urged the boys to spend time with the grooms, where they picked up obscene language and adult themes. The boys were encouraged to bed women, young, old, and at your full pleasure. Catherine attempted to control the boys, which only served to push the children towards their father leaving Catherine isolated. In 1825, in order to pay the outstanding debts, Catherine placed her home, Wanstead House, up for sale. The sale included the auctioning off of the contents. The house itself received no interest 
of being bought. As such, it was pulled down, board by board, with the timber and fabrics being sold. The house, which had cost some £360,000 to build, was sold off piecemeal at a price roughly of £10,000. One of Catherine's last acts was to make her husband ward of the Chancery. Her will completely disherited her husband, who she by now was attempting to seek a divorce from. Catherine died at the relatively young age of 35. The press stated that she had died of a broken heart, but historic speculation had speculated that the cause would have been related to the venereal disease she had received from her husband. In her will, the children were left in the care of her sisters. The eldest, on whom the whole of her fortune now resided, was actively pursued by his father in attempts to take control and ownership of the boy. These attempts were unsuccessful. William died in debt supposedly from heart disease, living on a small allowance of £10 a week from family. His obituary was lacking in any hint of sorrow of his demise. From the Morning Chronicle on the 4th of July, 1857, a spendthrift, a profligate and a gambler in his youth, he became debauched in his manhood redeemed by no single virtue, adored by no single grace, his life gone out even without a flicker of repentance. That concludes this episode of Frightful Fridays, the aristocracy scandal and murder. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers, and with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are serial killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrages, organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. And Fridays are frightful, where we pull together several stories with a similar theme. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>